So I'm doing a talk on why evangelism. Um, perhaps a, doing a talk on evangelism for me um, seems like kind of like an extremely obvious seems like kind of an extremely obvious topic. Like you know, like doing a talk on why not hide the cure for cancer if you find it. Or like, why not? Why tell your friends and family when you get engaged or something like that? <laughs> So, <laughs> but truthfully, um, it, I think it would be kind of dishonest for me to get up here and, and try to talk about like, how excited I am about evangelism or um, all the success I've had in evangelism because the, the truth is that I'm, I've sort of reached a point um, where I'm dealing with a lot of burnout and a lot of cynicism and just a lot of frustration over the hundreds of people that I've tried to witness to in Chicago and the very few conversions that I've seen. And, uh, and evangelism to me seems like ideally it should be something where um, you're, you're so changed by the gospel and you're experiencing the joy of the Lord so much that it's something that just bubbles out of you and it's something that, that other people can, can see. Um, and and I, yeah, ideally, I think that's what evangelism is. Um, but for me, it's it can't always be that. As I'm struggling through through cynicism and through discouragement and depression and all those things after witnessing to so many people that just blew me off, um, the thing that really makes me keep going is being aware of the reality of judgment. I still know that my neighbors are going to stand before God one day and are going to be doomed if they haven't put their trust in Jesus. And uh, so I think, I think all of us understand why evangelism is important. And really what we need is, is a sort of a, a reminder, a prodding to have an evangelistic mindset. Um, a prodding to, to make us aware of, of the reality of judgment. And so I, just, I want to share a couple of stories, one from the Bible, one from my own life about how God worked out different circumstances in order to cause people to realize uh, the emergency of sharing good news. And uh, so the first one is from 2 Kings, uh, starting at the end of chapter 6. And uh, what's going on there is the king of Syria has decided that he wants to uh, besiege Samaria. And so sort of his strategy is he's brought in the Syrian army and they've sort of circled all around Samaria, and they're starving them out. They've cut off their resources to food and water, and, uh, and Samaria enters into this really terrible time of famine, and uh, they're just, they're starving, and uh, at one point the king of Israel hears a woman cry out, and he says, um, what's, what's wrong? And she says, we're just, we're starving, and uh, yesterday this woman said, Offer up your son, and we'll eat him today, and then tomorrow we'll eat your son. And she said, we boiled my son and ate him, and now she's hiding her son. And when the king heard this, he was just so distraught. He was just uh, steaming mad, and decided that he, for some reason, sort of took out his anger on Elisha. And so he sent a messenger to Elisha's house. And uh, when the messenger gets there, essentially what he says to Elisha is, this, this trouble is from the Lord. There's no point in us waiting on the Lord, because this problem is caused by the Lord. And Elisha doesn't deny that in particular, but he says, um, he says, tomorrow you'll be able to get two things of flour or two things of barley for a shekel, and food's going to be super cheap. And the king's messenger says, there's no way, even if the gates, even if the windows of heaven should open up, could that possibly happen? And Elisha says, oh, it'll happen, and you'll see it, but you won't get to partake of it. So in the meantime, there's these lepers that are sitting in the gate of, uh, of Samaria, and they're saying to themselves, okay, we probably shouldn't just wait here until we die. If we go into the city, we'll starve just like everyone else. We should go out to the camp of uh, the Syrians that are surrounding Samaria, and maybe they'll kill us, but maybe if we surrender, maybe they'll let us live, and then at least we can eat and we'll survive. And so that's what they do. And as they get to the edge of the camp of the Syrians, they see 
that it's a ghost town. There's, they've all fled. And what had happened was that the Lord had caused the Syrian army to hear the sound of chariots and, uh, and they'd said, oh no, like Israel's hired the Hittites and the Egyptians to come, come fight us. And so they fled and they left their tents and their horses and, and uh, you know, keep in mind this is not fiction, this is the biblical account of history. And, uh, and so these lepers get there and, and, they're, and they're like, wow, this is great. And they're having like a huge feast. And they're like taking gold clothing and like burying it for later and like having a grand old time. And then the reality check sets in and they realize all the people at Samaria are still starving and we know where the food is. And, and they actually say, in, in the text it actually says, today is a day of good news. And, uh, and, and so they, they go back and, and, and they, they tell them about it. And uh, so it's that. There's a lot of evangelistic points that can be drawn out of that text. But in, the point, in particular, I want to point out the, the reality check that happened. I mean, when they first stumbled upon all the goodness of the, of the spoil, and for a while, you know, they were, they were just enjoying it. But they weren't proclaiming it. And, uh, and so this, this is the thing I want to address. If our vision as part of Emmanuel is to be enjoying and proclaiming the, new, the good news, Christ in our great city, um, we've got to realize that it's entirely possible for us to fall into a habit of enjoying it without proclaiming it. And um, it's that reality check that's, that's going to spur us on to uh, take sharing the gospel seriously. Some of you know that I spent three summers working with a pastor, Pastor Jeff, in the Bronx, New York. And this tiny, it was this tiny little church plant in the South Bronx. It was like half the size of Emmanuel. And um, there was this one day that this guy Dave came to church because he was trying to sell vitamins. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Jesus, Dave, he can't sell vitamins in church. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, so anyway, so I knew, I knew that in about 10 minutes, like the service was going to start and I had a little bit of time and I thought to myself, hmm, okay, I could share the gospel with him now or I could wait till he comes a few more times and I could build a little bit more of a relationship with them, which is important in evangelism. But I decided, no, I think I'll, I think I'll just share the gospel with them now. And so I sat down with them, and I, like, point by point, I mean, from, like, you know, creation to the problem of sin to who Jesus is and what he did on the cross to the significance of the resurrection, like, took them point by point through what the gospel was. And, and then he wanted to pray and receive Christ when I was done. And so that was awesome. <laughs> and, uh, and then, you know, Pastor Jeff took him, he lived over near Yankee Stadium, so he took him home and he said in the van on the way home, you know, I received the Lord today. So then that week, Pastor Jeff and I, we were going around, we did a lot of visitation around New York, and uh, we went to Dave's apartment, and we were knocking on the door, and he wasn't answering, and we're like, eh, like, so he must just not be home today. And uh, we came back two weeks later, and we're knocking on his door, and he's still not answering, and I'm like, man, where's this guy? So we went to the apartment above his, and we knocked on that guy's door and said, Hey, have you seen, have you seen Dave? Like, is he around? And he said, Oh, two weeks ago, which is possibly the same day that I, that I witnessed Dave, he said a stench started coming up from Dave's apartment, and he had died of heat exhaustion in, in his apartment. And so when I, when I heard that, I thought, Okay, man, if I had decided I'm just going to wait a few more weeks and share the gospel with Dave later, I would have missed it, you know, and, and, and uh, you know, not that relational evangelism is important, but, but that was the reality check for me that, that helped me live in the realization that truly it's a point for man once to die and then to face judgment. And we all, you know, we've read that part of Hebrews, we know it's true, but I mean, for the, for the lepers, they had to remember the fact that there was a city full of starving, dying people in order to be caused to go back and share the news. And, and so that's, our, our, my question for us today is, you know, are we living in reality? Do we realize that when we walk the streets of Chicago that we're walking among millions of people that are truly damned unless they trust in Jesus? And I think if we live in that reality, it's going to cause us to evangelize.